tendremos la participación del doctor Allen Davis, biólogo y químico de la Universidad de Arizona, con maestría en vida silvestre y pesquerías de TNIM, doctorado en filosofía y nutrición, con más de 15 años como profesor asociado de la Escuela de Pesquería, Acuacultura y Ciencias Acuáticas de la Universidad de Airborne, Alabama, dedicando sus esfuerzos a la investigación, enseñanza y mejora de las tecnologías para el cultivo de especies en agua dulce y marina, con el propósito del crecimiento de las poblaciones naturales y de la acuacultura. Conferencia Eficiencia Económica, una perspectiva desde el manejo de alimentos. Good morning, and thank you very much for allowing me to join this meeting. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for allowing me to speak, as well as USEC uh, for helping sponsor my participation in this meeting. I'd like to share a little bit of my thoughts in terms of feed management perspective on how it affects economics of our farms. And if you look at you know aquaculture just across the world, it really doesn't matter where you are in the world, you're being affected by the same things. Of course, coronavirus right now is, is having a major influence, but there's going to be continued pressures in terms of making our farms more efficient, making sure that we produce the highest quality product that we can, and then also resource allocation. So, how you use the resources that you have at your fingertips. I have the pleasure of having Dr. Boyd across the, the hall from me, and we were talking the other day about some of the data that he's looking at in terms of certification data. It's pretty interesting. This was a, a quick glimpse of that from Asia and Latin America. Um, and the striking thing to me is that the feed conversions are much different between Asia and Latin America. Now, of course, survivals are, are measured differently, so that's probably the reason there, but feed conversion is pretty much the same thing. The difference is they are much more in tune with feed management and are working much harder to maintain good feed conversions than I think happens in a lot of different countries. And this is a, a big economic uh, downfall for Latin America. So, you know, remember, we're businesses and we need to continually improve and I'm one for continually looking at processes and how to improve those processes. So if you talk about reduced revenues at the farm level, you know, you take that problem and start asking why, what is the real root cause of that? And you can say, there's a few things that we can control and we can't control. We can't control the world supply, or at least legally, we can't do that. Demand from our consumers is driven by their choices. Um, and that is really what drives the price that we receive at the market. So we can influence consumers' choice to a certain degree. So we can choose the market that we're going to enter. Maybe we want to enter a, a commodity market, get the lowest price, or maybe we want to do a specialty market and get a higher price. We can control where we go. Um, we can also control our production costs. So if we look at our feed, the things that we do to maintain the culture environment, the processing that we do, these are things that we can control. And quite often people talk about cutting the cost of their feed. Well, the feed is the largest variable cost on a farm, usually 40 to 60%. But the reality is a farmer can receive more profits by properly managing the feed than the feed mill can save in a feed formulation change. So I'm a nutritionist and I deal with feed formulation changes all the time. And the reality is, yes, we can save some money through man manipulation of the feed formulation. But the reality is the farmer can save far more money by properly managing his feed, then I can save by changing the formulation. If you look at you know, some old data, um, when I first got to the facility we're at, um, we started looking at feed management because we knew we had to improve it. This is one of our very first experiments. And you see, we did a 25% shift in our feed going up and going down. And if you look at the area of production 
where we did those shifts in the amount of feed that went in, there was absolutely no change in the growth rates of those animals. What did that tell us? We're overfeeding. We need to work on feed management. I've been at our facility for about 20 years now. And over those years, we've done a lot of different experiments. And this on the left is just a simple summary of production from our facility, showing where we were at 120 days, and now we're at 90 days using automatic feeders. But when I started, you know, we had about 4,000 kilos per hectare of production, and we had standard feed conversions. That was acceptable to have a feed conversion of two to one back in those days, but it wasn't acceptable to me as a nutritionist. So we started working on our feed management and we brought our feed conversions down and we've pretty much been below 1.5. We're pretty much in that 1.2, 1.4 range, most of our production. But you can see that we've reduced that and we did that through feed management. Now, of course, our more recent additions, we've gone to a 90 day cycle because now we're using automatic feeding systems and we can get a faster growth for those systems. But when we were doing two feedings per day by hand, you know, we were able to do that by restricting the feed inputs. So if you look at the basics of nutrition, nutrition and feeding practices go hand in hand. The diet is pretty much worthless unless it's properly stored and it's properly applied. And then of course the application is worthless unless the diet is nutritious. So both proper feed manufacturing and formulation and proper distribution of that feed are very important to get the best out of your performance. And it, and it surprises me that a lot of farmers do not understand that. So let me put it in perspective that I think more people would understand. If you look at nutrition and production, it's not the quantity of the feed that's important. It's the level of nutrients that are delivered, okay? It's just like with money. I've got two pictures here on the right. One lady with a large quantity of money and a lady on the bottom with less bills, but much higher denominations. And I think everyone would agree that they'd rather have the money in the lower picture than the other picture, even though there's more probably in the top picture in terms of numbers. So it's not, you know, the quantity, it's really the delivery of nutrients, just like when we look at using money to pay for somebody. So we've done a lot of trials and because of time, I'm just gonna show you, you know, one or two examples, but we've looked at this in the lab, in the outdoor systems, green water systems, et cetera. But the same response occurs. So this is an example where we have 30% protein and we fed it three different levels of the ration. So we're saying it's 100, 75, or 50. And then we have a 40% protein diet, again, feeding at three different levels. And if I didn't have my feed management proper, I'd actually see no difference across these feed inputs or these nutrient densities. But because we do have proper feed management, we can see responses. But what's interesting is if you take the 30 at 100% ration and feed 75% of the quantity, but use a 40% protein diet, you get the exact same growth. But of course, you're gonna reduce your feed conversion. So that same comparison, we've reduced the feed conversion. And you see this as you move to more nutrient dense diets and properly apply the feed, you will get reductions in feed conversions. Of course, we have to properly apply the feed. Again, after you know, a number of different trials, this being an example, that you see that the daily intake of protein correlates to the growth rate of the shrimp. So it's not the quantity of feed, it's the quantity of protein that's driving our growth. And that means we have to manage it properly. We've also done this in the ponds so as an example from our ponds, again, a 30% protein diet versus a 40% protein diet, but we've adjusted the ration. So I have a, the ration at 100%, 75, or again, 75 here. And if you see the weight gain, the yield, 
fee conversion survivals are pretty much identical across these two. Now, when we reduce the ration, going from 100 to 75, we actually reduce the weight, the yields, but we have the same fee conversion, the same survival. So again, if we have our feed management properly, it's not the quantity of feed, it's the nutrient delivery that is important. So again, what we want to do is have nutrient density and delivery of the feed to match growth, right? And, you know, you do this on a daily basis. Feed is no different than money. You don't simply pull out a bunch of bills to pay somebody. So let's take an example. I've got 10 bills in each one of these piles on the right hand side. If I owed somebody $50, I wouldn't simply pick up the pile of ones, hand it to them and expect them to be happy because they're going to be underpaid. Now, if I own $50 and I pick up the $5 bill pile, they're going to be happy and they're going to do the job that they were hired to do. If I pick up the hundred or the tens, which has hundred or the twenties, which would be $200, they're also going to be happy. Matter of fact, they're going to be very happy, but they're not going to do any better job than what I hired them to do. They're just overpaid for the job that's being performed. The same applies to feed. If we feed too much of a nutrient dense diet, we're overpaying. And so it's costing us money or it's not giving us the best performance. The same example is with feed conversion. If you can make the comparison to money, if I have 10 $1 bills, that's a fee conversion of 10 to one. If I have two $5 bills, that's a fee conversion of two to one. If I have one $10 bill, that's a fee conversion of one to one. Remember, feed conversion from a nutritional standpoint depends on nutrient density of the diet. You're going to have a lower feed conversion when you have a higher nutrient density. Now, if we look at this on the farm level, the farm based feed conversion is based on the nutrient density of the diet, but it's also on how much feed is wasted. Maybe you overfeed or if you have animals that die, that's essentially wasted feed. And then, of course, there's a positive benefit. If you manage properly, the contribution of natural productivity is going to actually reduce your feed conversion. So understanding you know, feed conversion at the farm level is very important. And it's a very good tool. When I go onto a farm to look at feed management, one of the first things I do is look at feed conversion in theory at different points in production. So what I'll typically do is look at a two to three week window during the production cycle and do it for different places. You can easily estimate the weight. That's very easy to do. You know how much food you put into the system. The big question is survival to determine you know, what that survival is. But you can estimate your survivals and get an estimate of what your feed conversion is. And then if you look at different two week intervals, you can estimate if you're underfeeding or overfeeding. And it's very simple. If your feeding feed conversion is 1.5 or greater, you really need to work on your feed management. Or you have a genetics that is very poor conversion. And there are some genetic lines that have very poor conversions for feed. But if you have a good genetic line, good environmental conditions, you should be low down in that 1.2 to 1.5 range. If you're there, you can still improve things but you're in a reasonable place. Now, if you're at 1.2 in terms of your fee conversion, you're doing great, but still look to improve, look to things that can be improved. Now, you know, many people think switching to a cheaper feed is gonna improve their economics. This is an actual example. So one of my friends got some costs of feeds and sent it to me because he had this exact question. And so you can see these are all designed you know, for the same reasonably same nutrient delivery, but they're different levels of protein. So we've got a 25, a 28, and a 35% protein feed. And this is the cost per kilogram that they were paying for that feed. You know, so maybe you, my preference would be to use a 35% protein, but maybe you choose to use a 28. Um, so theoretically, if you went down in protein, you'd save money. The question is that, is that really true? And to me, 
there's two ways to look at this. Number one, if you have a bad fee conversion. So if your fee conversion is 1.5 or higher, you're never going to see a difference if you change your feed. More than likely, you're overfeeding. So changing the protein level of diet really isn't going to make much of a difference. You have to get the feed management under control. So in this case, you're overextending. So get the cheapest feed that you want, and that's going to give you your best response, so to speak. I mean, these ladies, if I fed them steak in this quantity, it would cost me a fortune. Much better to feed them hamburgers. But you're throwing money out the window. So you need to get that feed management under control. If you look at the actual cost from a nutritional standpoint, so this is the way I look at the costs. Here we have our 25%, 28 and 35% protein feeds. And now I've calculated the cost per unit of protein that I'm buying, because that's really what's determining the growth rate of your animals is the protein intake. There's plenty of energy in the diet. It's protein intake that you need to worry about. And you can see that actually the cost per unit of protein is much cheaper in the 35% protein diet than it is in the 28 or the 25. So if you're a farmer looking at this very simplistically and you just want to buy 100 kilos of feed, you're absolutely right. 100 kilos of feed for 25% protein gives you 25 kilograms of protein at a cost of $81. If you have 100 kilograms of the 35, you're going to get 35 kilos of protein at a cost of $93. But that's not the right way to look at it. Reality is, if you're buying the 35% protein diet and you want to compare it to the 25, you only need to buy 71.4 kilograms of that 35% protein diet to get the same growth response. That would be at a cost of 66.40. So that's a lot less money because I'm using a higher quality feed and I'm properly applying it. In general, you're going to get the best results when you have a quality feed and you properly apply it. Now, feed management and water quality also interact. And I'm not going to talk in depth on water quality, but I want to make you think a little bit about this. Remember, water quality is going to affect your growth, your stress, the quality of the product, and survivals. There are numerous ways to meet water quality, and I'm not promoting any specific mechanism. What I do want to point out as you go from a high protein diet, so this is a 44% protein diet to a 32% protein diet. And this was done with fish in a recirculating system. We then quantified the quantity of solids produced, either as per kilogram of feed or per kilogram of biomass. And you can see there's more solids produced as you decrease the protein content. Now, if you're running a bioflock system and you actually want to produce bacterial biomass, maybe that's a good thing. But in most cases, we want to minimize the amount of wastes because that costs us money in terms of processing. Now remember, in terms of water quality management, you can push your systems different directions. So this is kind of the way I think of, of these systems is you may have a denitrification and heterotrophic or a bacterial driven system with a little bit of algae or phototrophic giving you your water quality. You can also take your system and push it more to a phototrophic system or algae based, in which case you still have some denitrification and heterotrophic systems, but you've gotten your ideal water quality. So there's not a right answer, but some answers work better than others for different people. As far as I'm concerned, you can solve your water pro quality problems by exchanging water. I'm not a fan of that. It costs you money and it brings in diseases. You can manage your water quality through aeration, through reuse of water, different techniques. And we've looked at some of these, not in pond-based systems, but we've looked at them in a bioflock or intensive type systems. And I wanna share some of those, that data with you very quickly. So if when we're talking bioflock, and I use this term very liberally, we're talking about a community of bacteria, algae, protozoa, that are then used to actually treat our water to bring about better water quality. Um, and it's produced by giving carbon as a carbon source, right? And also maybe some nitrogen, okay? But 
these bacterial-based and algae-based, fungal-based systems are also food for tilapia, or in our case, shrimp. So it works very well with shrimp. And you can take different carbon sources. So this is an example in the lab. There's no animals involved. We're just producing the bioflock. You can take different carbon sources, and you're going to produce different levels on a dry weight basis of bioflock. And those bioflock is going to have different levels of nutrients in it. In, in general, the more flock you produce, a little bit lower protein content you're going to find in those systems, as you can see in this example. But you can change the quantity and the nutrition of these systems. Now, for me, these you know, water quality management techniques are really branding. They're a way that people describe what they're doing, but they're all doing the same thing. And so again, I'm not promoting any one, but we have semi-intensive, intensive, we have the Belizean system, you have heterotrophic production systems, you have mixotrophic production systems, um, you have um, symbiotic systems. There's lots of different ways people describe them, but they're doing very similar things. And so we wanted to look at some of these systems because a lot of people feel these are, are cutting their costs. So we looked at, for example, symbiotics, a probiotic with a prebiotic plus fermentation, basically symbiotics in a very simple way. But basically you're carbon loading using specific processes to create natural productivity and to process water, which is then done in, in pond systems and intensive systems, depending on what you're doing. And it's done in a lot of different places. Um, Belize, Mexico, Korea, most countries will find systems where they're using these type of production systems. So we wanted to kind of look at this in the laboratory systems. And so we did this in a lab, in a, in a bioflock type system, so tank-based systems. And we've looked at a number of different treatments. So we took a symbiotic profile that we got from one of our uh, colleagues, farmers. So adapted a, a commercial application, you can see on the right-hand side. So this is aeration, uh, aerobic fermentation, basically. We did that with the enzyme. We did it without the enzyme. We then did bioflock, which basically you're using the same carbon source, but instead of filtering the carbon source, which you would do in the uh, previous two, you actually just put that carbon source in the culture water. And then we did absolutely nothing. We just let the system do whatever it wanted to. In all cases, we inoculated with a bioflock to get things going. So, we did see some differences in this experiment in terms of growth, in terms of final biomasses. Um, and you can see that actually just straight bioflock did the best. Now, maybe in your system, it's going to be a different one. But all of these produced very good growth. All of them allowed us to uh, have good water quality and very good feed conversions and survivals. So although there may be slight differences, you know, they basically all worked. And that included doing nothing, just feeding a 35% protein feed and inoculating with a, a starter culture. Now, we've also looked where we looked at bioflocks with and without probiotics. This is an example of that. Um, again, to show we get good growth, we get good feed conversions. Um, doing absolutely nothing gave us pretty much the same results. Now, these are not with disease challenges. Um, so maybe with a disease challenge, you'll get different results, but this is in a disease-free environment. But again, all of these systems seem to work. And we've also been looking at feed management in these systems um, because it's quite interesting. A lot of people are doing these intensive systems and there's some questions in terms of contribution of natural productivity and, every, and other feed management questions. So this is an example and again, a, a common bioflock system but one of the things we did is we could regress back and predict how much growth was coming from the bioflock. We got about 30% of the growth came from the bioflock. But we could use different levels of feed, which is on our left. So we simply adding different quantities of feed. We're re representing it as percentage of a standard, which would be 100%. But as you can see, as you add more and more feed to the system, we get improvements in growth and then it starts plateauing off. It's diminishing returns as you add more and more feed to get to maximum growth rates. And then of course, as you move from low feed inputs to high feed inputs, your feed in conversion ratio is gonna get worse. 
So that means it's going to cost you more and more money in terms of the feed to get that faster growth rate because you have diminishing returns in terms of growth rate, but also you have a lower contribution from natural productivity. The feed is in the water longer. So the more feed you put into the system, the longer it's going to be in the water before it's consumed. That's going to reduce your feed conversion. And then also the more feed that shrimp have available to them, they seem to um, not eat as efficiently. So another trend that we see is people using fermentation as a partial feed replacement. Now, do not get me wrong. Fermentation is a good way to enhance the, the profile of a given nutrient. So in this case, we're looking at soybean meal as a fermentation. And you can reduce anti-nutritional factors. You can create some bioactive compounds. You can potentially improve the digestibility a little bit, especially when it's a low quality ingredient. And it's, these are used in feeds, but now we see farmers using them as a partial replacement for feed, either pelleting it or, or simply using it straight away, but they're fermenting it on the farm and then using it as a replacement. So we had an interest in looking at this. Now, don't get me wrong, there's lots of benefits that fermentation has that we're not looking at. It's acidifying the digestive system. It's a source of bioactive compounds. It's a source of pre and probiotics. What I wanted to look at is simply as a nutritional nutrient source, as a replacement for the feed. So again, we did this in a clear water system. We did this in a green water system. This is a little complicated, but here we have 25% of a standard ration from feed or from the soy. We then have 50%. We use both soy and the feed to do this. And you see this, response is the same. So if we take soy only and increase it, which is the yellow, we see no major growth response. So there's not a dose response. If we take and add it to the feed, we see we do get a response, but it's nearly not the same as the response from the feed. And here you have on the right hand side, a graph of that. So this blue is simply feed. The green is feed plus 25% coming from soy, and you can see it's displaced. That means you're not getting the same performance. You're only getting about a third the performance from the soy as you are from the feed, and only at a low level of inclusion. Now, we also did that in a green water system, so they have access to natural productivity. And again, we say, saw the exact same response. So if you look at this from an economic standpoint, and we were using a 35% protein feed, so I pulled these numbers from what I gave you before. But if I simply buy soy in the US, it's going to cost me 38 cents. If I look at the conversion to the equivalence of feed, it's 28 cents. But the reality is it only supported one third of the growth, so the actual cost is about 84 cents um, per unit of growth. So to me, it's not economically viable. To me, it doesn't make sense. And the only way this does sort of make sense is if you're using it at a low level. We're using it at about 17% of the feed because we're feeding on a nitrogen equivalence. So realize, maybe it is doing something in your system, maybe it's not, but you really need to look at what happens if I simply don't feed that quantity of feed and compare that to out actually using it in combination with the soy. A lot of times I think that the farmer is actually overfeeding, so the benefit by this process is not using soy, it's simply that they pull back the feed and the soy is having less impact on the system. So it looks like you're having improved economics. So, you know, in summary, farms are complex, water quality management is key. And I'm not telling you how to manage your water quality with different choices. Whatever works, use it. But use the resources wisely. Remember, if you're using these fermentation products or if you're carbon loading your system, it is going to shift your natural productivity. And that may have a benefit in your system. But remember, it also has an oxygen demand. So be careful because you do have to oxidize all that carbon that goes in there. But I think a lot of the times when we're using these systems, what we're really doing is we're shifting from 
high phototrophic to a little bit more bacterial-based systems, and that's where we're seeing our, our benefits. So remember, feed management is a control, a critical control point. Overfeeding, if you have overfeeding going on at your facility, when you change the feed or the protein content of the feed, you're not going to see a response, and that's because you're overfeeding. But if you're feeding properly, using a quality feed is going to provide you with the best results and the most economic results. And with that, I think I'm probably out of time. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer them. Now, I would like to thank my team. I don't do this research by myself. I've got a lot of hardworking graduate students. Well, maybe they're not always hardworking, but here they are down harvesting shrimp this last year during coronavirus, so we're all wearing our masks. Um, but I got a big group that works for me and, and helps out to do all this research, so we really need to take them into consideration. With that, um, just remind you that I think that uh, U.S. soy is very good about promoting sustainable aquaculture. That's a good resource for you guys, and I look forward to having future meetings with you. If there's any questions, happy to take them uh, either through the chat box or as translated. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, we don't have question for you today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Pleasure.